as a reminder, you can send questions to center at cis.org. I already have one, but I wanted to ask a question since I'm, I own the microphones. Um, the question for you, Victor, and this is the issue, it actually relates both to the US and to Europe. What, you talked about gatekeeper states and have written about that some for the center as well. In other words, countries, you know, next to or near the destination countries and getting their cooperation and what have you. But what do you do with, especially in the case of seaborne migration, when there is no government? Because Libya, I mean, kind of, Libya doesn't really have a government, and Haiti doesn't really have a government. Um, where do you, what do you do with people that you do, say, on the high seas? Uh, you know, you, you take, you interdict the boats, and um, who do you, who do you deliver them to if you were going to do that? Because you mentioned Albania, but Albania has a functioning government. Uh, Libya doesn't really, and neither does Haiti. What do you do in those kind of cases? Yeah, first of all, I think it's it's important to emphasize that uh, human smuggling and organized crime is about money and benefits. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that, uh, well, there's no really functioning government in, in Libya, but there is a somehow functioning Libyan Coast Guard. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and even when the situation was much worse in uh, 2017, somehow at, at, somehow at a certain point, uh, the Libyan militias who previously controlled uh, human smuggling, they stopped to send the boats. Uh, there were rumors, I, I, I don't want to believe to them, that uh, the Italian government paid for the, the smuggling networks, that, okay, this is the money. They got some political concession uh, to get some position in the government, which means uh, possibilities to, to reach the, the assets of the Libyan state, oil, etc., etc. But anyhow... The, so they, they paid the militias that were smuggling people to not smuggle them. Yes. In other words... Don't get your money from the, the aliens. We'll give you the money. Just don't smuggle the aliens. At least according wow. to the rumors. Yeah. And I think it's very important that, that you can use these political concessions also because uh, just changing the money, it's, it's, it's not a solution. And I think mm -hmm. this Albanian case is also very important because we are speaking a lot about these third countries as a, as a possibilities for co uh, cooperation. And of course, it's always a trade-off. Uh, and this is why everybody is very uh, exciting, uh, excited what will be the end of this Albanian collaboration. Because if there is a possible collaboration with Albania, if the UK managed to collaborate with Rwanda, mm -hmm. it means that there are perhaps possible third countries which, which can be uh, places for asylum procedures. And everybody's speaking about the, how, how costly is it. For example, the, the United Kingdom paid uh, 120 million pounds for uh, Rwanda, uh, for the Rwanda initiative. And it seems a lot of money. And of course, I would be happy to see this money in my, my bank loan. But comparing the price uh, and what illegal immigration means, uh, certain countries are and I would like to refer uh, the analysis of um, Steve Camerot, who wrote, I think, that uh, one illegal immigrant cost $68,000 per year for the United States. So comparing this money, I think it's a really cheap solution. It's a bargain, yeah, twice yeah. the price. So here we have a question, and I guess, George, this would be for you, but anybody wants to um, chime in. How does the... Uh, the wet, so-called wet foot, dry foot policy with regard to Cubans showing up in Florida that the um, Clinton administration put in place, how does that relate to what you're talking about? Isn't that sort of, in other words, the, the idea was if Cubans got onto the beach, so they were feet were dry, that they got to get in. If they didn't, they didn't. And so presumably if their feet were wet, as it were, um, they would still be in U.S. territorial waters in many instances. How does that relate to what you were talking about? Um, the wet foot, uh, dry foot policy uh, related, uh, as you said, to Cubans and essentially was if they reached uh, dry land on U.S. territory, they were in. And under the Cuban Migration Act, which has been the law since the 1960s, once they've been in the country for a year, they then can uh, become permanent residents. 
which is unique uh, unique to Cubans. Uh, but if they were encountered uh, uh, in on on the seas, uh, they could be returned to Cuba or to a uh, third country. Uh, the issue, the, the legality of it, I'm not sure was ever um, litigated. Hmm. But I'm sure the uh, the issues would be exactly. Uh, the same and the the principles the Supreme Court enunciated, uh, at least in terms of um, the high seas, would be the same. They could be returned to Cuba without any sort of asylum screening or anything else. Should that be the dis- what the U.S. government wanted to do? So nobody challenged the policy at the time. I mean, that's interesting. Um, I, I need to double check that, but I'm, I I don't remember interesting uh, okay. legal challenges going on. Interesting. So I have another question, and this is sort of relates, I mean, whoever wants to take it, but it kind of relates to what you talked about, Victor, because this, um, they're asking about this Albania, the deal Italy has with Albania. And isn't that kind of like our Remain in Mexico program in the sense that they, it's like Remain in Albania, but you can still apply for asylum in Italy, right? So um, it's very much similar. And that really doesn't solve the problem in some sense because they're still able to apply for asylum. Whether they're, it's part of Remain in Mexico, which this administration has discontinued but may start again, or they remain in Albania, even if they're not Albanian, they're sent back there but can then apply for asylum. So is that, I mean, is that the way it works for this Albanian deal? Is the same kind of thing as Remain in Mexico? A little bit, yes, but the difference is that... Uh uh, similar, similarly to the United States, uh, one of the biggest challenge for the European asylum system is that it's it's uh, highly overburdened, and the procedures have years of backlog. And what's happening, or what will happening in Albania, is actually a pre-filtering process. So, uh, asylum seekers will spend uh, four weeks there. This is the maximum time, so uh, uh, 28 days. And during this uh, time, the Italian, Italian authorities can pre-check whether these people have any chance to oh. get, get asylum in Italy. And if there's a ch- possibility, they will be transferred for a regular procedure into uh, the Italian territory. The big question is what will happen if they, they are not. Uh, and it will be the, the core stone of whether it's uh, maintenable or not, because if they spent four weeks in Albania and anyhow they will be transferred to Italy or they will stuck there because Italy can't repatriate them to the, the country of origin, then it will be the same case. And uh, I'm not sure that an Albanian authorities will be ready to host 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, uh, uh, let's say, economic migrants in their territories, not to mention that they are already on the land and uh, uh, crossing the Western Balkan, it's uh, relatively easy to, to reach the European land borders also. Interesting. So just to put it in our context, they wait in Albania, but rather than waiting there for a full asylum hearing, they wait until they get what we call a credible fear interview to yeah. see whether they might qualify. That's interesting. Um, Definitely. So, George, there's a question for you, but anybody who wants to take it, um, Eric, you too. What, I mean, specifically, what kind of authority do governors have in dealing with seaborne immigration? Um, is this something that really hasn't been litigated? What's the, what's the story on that? That is an excellent question. I don't think there really is an answer right now. I think there may be an answer soon in the context of the Supreme Court uh, considering the state of Texas's SB4 legislation, uh, which... Uh, essentially, in certain circumstances, allows Texas officials to, quote unquote, deport uh, aliens uh, back to Mexico. I would think under the precedent of the Supreme Court's Arizona decision um, of about a decade or so ago under Justice Kennedy's opinion that uh, the Supreme Court, uh, if if asked to decide a case, would say states don't have the right to do that. Um, But you know, that was the Supreme Court a decade ago. Who knows what it will decide now, but all eyes should be on how it rules in this Texas case. Interesting. 
one thing when I was looking at it, I thought about was what other area of the law does the federal government not want states to help them? We're talking about drug smuggling or, or whatever it is. Immigration is the one where they say to the states, please don't help us. And, you know, states obviously can patrol their own waters. Um, for law enforcement purposes, but the issue is if you're encountering someone who is an alien, who's inadmissible, the state has possession of them, detains them, what, what the federal government says you must let them go, I don't think the state really has a choice other than to let them go. Unless, this, unless you have like a 287G agreement or something where the federal government says to the state, please help us. And I think that's where you need to look at it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so just a uh, a, s a small remark uh, about this whole third country issue, Albania, Rwanda, etc., etc. Uh, there was a recent survey by a, a German think tank uh, in Africa, and they tried to figure out which which policies has any effects for deterrence of people who are not asylum seekers, just economic migrant, and they want to leave uh, for Europe for the the greener pastures. And it revealed that not the uh, the reduction of or accessibility of social services for asylum seekers or shortening the asylum procedure or any other uh, has any significant effect. Only one reveal that has very important effects, this outsourcing activity. Because if somebody heard about a possibility that making the route, paying thousands of dollars for human smugglers, and he will be returned to Rwanda for the whole asylum procedure or Albania, well, it has a almost 30% deterrence uh, factor in the survey. So I think it's very important to, to, to emphasize that uh, the real case is not whether Italy will be uh, successful to make this annual, now the annual cap is 36,000 procedure in Albanian areas. It's, okay. it's, it's a peanut. And in the case of uh, UK, if even they managed to, to fly, uh, to, to manage the flights back to Rwanda, some thousand persons annually. Not, not, it's not the real case. The real case is a deterrence effect of it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the, um, we have a question here. It's sort of, again, on the Cubans in Florida issue. Uh, and this is a political thing. Maybe, Eric, you would know about this. Is, is the Cuban lobby in Florida politics an obstacle to Governor DeSantis, or whoever is in charge of Florida, acting on this. And I would just add, before you have any comments, I just read a story yesterday about a bunch of Cubans who showed up in, um, not Key West, but one of the Keys, and or at least was approaching it. And apparently Florida, whichever the state agency is, it's like, uh, I don't know, wildlife or something like that, intercepted them, handed over them to the Coast Guard, and that was the end of it, and they were sent back. So it doesn't seem that um, the, you know, important Cuban lobby in Florida sort of prevents any efforts on the state level to enforce their own coastline border. Uh, and you're, it is the Wildlife Service, that right. one of the agencies that was tasked with turning people around. I think probably the Cuban lobby is less influential than it was, say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I think another difference is a lot of people are coming from places other than Cuba, and that determines right. their um, willingness to allow Governor DeSantis to, to stop it. Right, right. Um, this, is a, this is for me, and it relates to Cuba, but also relates to Europe to some degree. Um, this idea of the gatekeeper countries, in other words, in, in our context here, the countries on the other side of the water. Uh, Cuba is not a friend of the United States. I mean, we have a migration agreement, so there is we do have some kind of cooperation with them, but they're not our friend. And in fact, they've launched, you know, migration attacks basically against the United States, um, instrumentalizing immigration. As we would, that's a European term. We would call it weaponizing as part of the, for instance, the um, Mario boat lift. But Europe has some degree. I, I mean, I don't know, Victor, you can fill in. It's not the same degree of hostility, but... You know, Turkey's Erdogan is not super friendly with Europe. And um, is that a challenge when you're dealing with the country in the other side of the water that isn't really all that interested in stopping maritime illegal immigration unless you pay them to do so? In other words, maritime illegal immigration is one of the ways 
migration can be weaponized against countries and how, you know how do you how does a country deal with that any ideas okay uh, yeah. oh, then I will start yes of course it's a possibility so it's uh, the gatekeeper countries are not only friends but uh, possible actors which can blackmail Europe and mm -hmm. or the United States it's, and it's very visible but Again, ladies and gentlemen, there are bad and worse decisions. <laughs> so, uh, if you have a look at Turkey, you now current the current number of Syrian refugees in Turkey is 3.6 million people. There are, according to rough estimations, between half and one million other uh, refugees and Afghans, there are Bangladeshi, other people. So, all, let's say more than four million people. Okay, so. Uh, yes, uh, Ankara played this instrumentalization of weaponization uh, story in 2020, and they let some tens of thousands of people to, to try to cross. Okay, But each month when this deal is working, it means tens of thousands of people at least who didn't cross the European borders. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very complex collaboration. We have to invest in it. Uh, it's a possibility for blackmailing, but to take us through, I, I don't know uh, until this point a better solution. Mark, I... Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I just uh, recollect that uh, uh, during the Trump administration, uh, President Trump's uh, solution was to threaten massive tariffs against imports from Mexico, which seemed to have been influenced right. uh, the Mexican government. But Mexico would be more comparable to Turkey in that sense, in that they're not really enemies, but they're willing to leverage their geographical position to get money and other benefits. Cuba's, I mean, Cuba is more, even with the end of the Cold War, and it's no longer a Soviet colony, um, it still is more hostile to us than um, most other examples of nearby countries. And since it's the big country that's re relevant to maritime illegal immigration, that's potentially a problem. Yeah. Eric, did you have any if, thoughts? If policies are put in place, a new president comes in or Congress stops funding what's happening or states have a bigger role, start playing a bigger role, smugglers are going to take any available avenue. And if that becomes by water oversea, they're going to do that. And as George pointed out, the president, the executive has a lot of authority to act. But that doesn't mean that there's policies in place. You just can't, you know, the federal government can't turn on a dime and say, okay, we have these things in place to deal with it. And I think we have a federal government that's unprepared if we were to see that challenge to, to have a response, at right. least one that would, that would be effective immediately. I mean, personally, it seems to me this is a, the whole issue of maritime illegal immigration, the potential of it, is a really strong argument for further normalization of relations with Cuba because Cuba really is, you know, potentially in the catbird seat in dictating, um, uh, you know, in, in using immigration as a weapon against us. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that establishing a more normal relationship with Cuba is an important part of trying to limit the potential for future um, maritime illegal immigration. I just had a last question. This one's from me. Um, and this is a kind of broader thing, almost sort of the premise of what we're talking about. Uh, a couple of years ago, I remember talking to Victor about this issue of land borders versus sea borders and which is which are easier to defend. And my sense had always been, well, it's obviously better if you have a sea border because you can't just walk across the water. And if it's the Atlantic Ocean, then that's probably true. But in cases where it's you know a, a, a shorter area that is practical to cross, um, you know it seems to me. I mean, Victor's persuaded me that land borders are actually way better to have than sea borders. Uh, anybody has any uh, thoughts on that, Victor? Yes, because. You know, we have, uh, let's say, not so friendly nations in the, the European neighborhood. Right. Uh, and it's Belarus and the Russia. And they weaponized illegal immigration 2021, uh, 22. When so they, not to interrupt, but in a sense, that's the equivalent to Cuba for us. Yeah, yeah right. in, in diplomatic terms. But it's terms, a land border. Yes. Or, or they are worse, I think. Yeah. Uh, but it's a land border. And it was very evident that 
Poland completely closed its land border and they launched this uh, ugly pushback uh, practice, sending back everybody. And within months, it revealed that it's not a possibility to send tens or hundreds of thousands of people across the land borders because it was fortified by physical barrier. The United States don't have the, the similar possibilities in the sea because of Cuba. Because, okay, even if you stop them the high sea, okay, what are you doing? You, you can't bring back to Cuba. If you're going to the shore, well, the Cuban Navy will shut or something else. And likewise, as you mentioned in the Mediterranean, if you have a rickety boat and they, you know, tow it out to the international waters from Libya and then leave it, if they start sinking, you yeah. have to go and save them. There is no, you're not going to drown yeah, on true. the border between Belarus and yeah, uh, it's Poland. Well, this sort of a combination of land and sea in which, um, you know, the uh, Biden administration or some future administration could again use Guantanamo Bay in Cuba as a place uh, where tens of thousands of people can be held and uh, uh, both for processing and as a deterrent. They're not getting into the United States. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and it's in, just as a last point, your combination of land and sea reminded me that we talk about illegal immigration from Mexico all the time, coming across the Rio Grande or coming across the land border. The Rio Grande's water, but it's essentially like a land border. But you're seeing, and this was just in the news recently, um, smugglers bringing people up the Pacific coast on boat and then putting them on small, fast boats and getting them into, um, you know, San Diego area or L.A. or well, maybe not quite as far as L.A., but that's a kind of combination land and sea migration as well. So um, anyway, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for um, participating in this. I think this was a really useful discussion. This is an issue that we really, that just hasn't been talked about enough about the particular challenges that maritime illegal immigration presents, even though we're always talking about land-based illegal immigration. So um, this, we will have um, the recording of this on our website. And um, as a reminder, again, this is a International Network for Immigration Research, INIR, event. And so it will be on INIR's website as well. Eventually, once it gets up, I'm not going to give the uh, web address yet because it's still, um, it hasn't been fully cooked yet. Um, in the meantime, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, gentlemen, for participating. And we hope you will come and um, listen to our next event.